Hey everybody, this is George Courser. Just wanted to give you guys a quick uh, overview of how the Parrots protocol handles public key infrastructure. So I'm going to give you a short presentation called Parrots PKI. Hope you enjoy it. We're going to talk about two things basically. One is the basic uh, public key infrastructure, PKI. And the second one is how Parrots handles PKI. Basic idea of, of PKI is there's two keys. Like a safety deposit box, uh, two keys are required for the security to happen. Unlike a safety deposit box though, only one key is used for encryption and the other is used for decryption. Either key can be used for either function. Now you may ask yourself where do these these keys come from? Well there's a there's a certificate authority, there's actually many certificate authorities, but just imagine that there's one that will give keys out to all the people who want to communicate privately. Each individual person will have one public key and one private key. Actually, each identifier will. So uh, you always keep your private key private and the public key is, is public so anyone can know it. Now basic cryptography notation, if we want to achieve confidentiality in other words, we want to make sure that the message cannot be read by anyone but the receiver. Then you encrypt it with the receiver's public key, and this is the notation. So the sender will encrypt the message M with the uh, receiver's public key, and then the receiver will open it with his private key. So the encryption is public and the decryption is private. In both cases, the keys are the receiver's keys. In non-repudiation, which simply means that you can verify that the person who sent the message is who they say they are. Non-repudiation. In this case we use the sender's IDs. The sender will send a message using his private key and the receiver will open it using the sender's public key. The idea is the receiver knows that the sender must have sent the message otherwise the message would not open uh, with the sender's public key. Now this brings us to the concept of a digital signature. Many of us have probably heard of a digital, digital excuse me, signature. What that means is that you have a message, M, and you, you create the message and you hash the message, which basically gives it a unique code, and then you encrypt that with the sender's uh, private key. When, you, when the receiver opens it with the sender's public key, just as it would in non-repudiation, they can check internally to see if the message is the, s the same as the hash. So the, the, the re receiver will open up the message and the hash, rehash the message received, and make sure it matches the hash that uh, was sent by the sender. What that means is that the message not only is non-repudiable, that is sent by the sender, but also it didn't change in transit so the integrity of the message is uh, is maintained. So it's called a digital signature. Now I was telling you about the, uh, the, the certificate authority on the prior slide. There's a thing called a digital certificate and what this, um, this is is basically a, uh, a couple of numbers. I mean a bunch of other information but the one number is the identifier and the second number is the uh, public key of that identifier. Um, so what happens is the certificate authority also has a public and private key. The certificate authority encodes, you know, encrypts a message using its private key that has in it the ID, like for example your email address, and the public key. And then the um, you can th then the receiver will open up that that message using the certificate authority's public key. It's assumed that everyone knows the certificate authority's public key. Um, so now we have here the the receiver gets that certificate and, and it knows that uh, what the public key is for the the ID that's in, in question, the sender's usually ID. So. So if you send your certificate with somebody to somebody, then they will have your public key, and then they can open up the message with your public key, and they know it came from you. So basically, in a nutshell, the digital certificates bind the IDs with public keys. When I say bind, I mean it makes them linked. That the ID, the, a certain public key belongs to a certain ID. 
A sender can send his digital certificate along with a message to make sure the receiver has the public key to open the message. For example, I might send a message if I'm the sender, I might send a message that's encrypted with my private key, but I'll send the certificate uh, so that the person has my public key so they can open the message. Now the problem with this is anyone could open the message <laughs> because they have the public key and, and so forth. If you want to make sure that only the receiver can read it, then you have to send that whole example message encrypted with the receiver's public key. And then the receiver can open this with his private key and it has all this message in here. So that way you have non-repudiation, confidentiality, and uh, integrity. Assuming that the message was signed. Okay, that's enough cryptography notation here. I think that you get the idea. Shorthand, we will use for the the the, the digital certificate. We'll use this type of notation here, cert of ID, for um, signed messages. We're not going to write out the whole hash thing. We'll just say sig of s of m. That means it was signed. And um, for an encrypted certificate and signed message, which is this whole uh, structure here. We'll just call that message from S to R of M. Incidentally, if you want, you can go check right now to see your own uh, digital certificates. Um, if you go to Internet Explorer and click on Tools and select Internet Options, if you go to the Content tab, you can click on the Certificates button and you can examine the information of your digital certificates. I'll leave that for you to do at your own leisure. Okay, so now how do vonets handle crypto? You remember the um, the structure of a of a vonet where you have a car and you have uh, an, a, a LBS location based service and and a bunch of infrastructure in between. If we call I the pseudo identity and VI the vehicle that has that particular pseudo identity, then we can call cert I uh, the digital certificate for that vehicle, and that's going to include not only the identity and the public key but also the validation period and also what services they're authorized to use and a bunch of other stuff. For the sake of this discussion let's call a, a location-based query request Q when you're asking somebody something. We could have used M but we're going to use Q for this discussion you'll see why in a minute. The signature uh, the signed the me me query Q from VI would be this notation here. And the we can write the query from VI to the LBS in terms of this notation, notation here. Notice that the thing will be signed with a location-based services public key. The reply from the LBS to the vehicle I is this uh, notation here. So basically, if your car sends a message out to the LBS, the LBS will send this message back to your car. Big picture. Remember that the encrypted message is a payload. So the encrypted message is signed, sealed, and, and you know, it hasn't been delivered yet. So we sign it and seal it with that encryption method. And then what happens is your vehicle will put a little, um, a basically a Mac layer uh, envelope around the, the the message, the application layer message, um, and then that message will go inside, your encrypted message will go inside the the package that's being sent from car to car. Then we're going to move, then then it, it'll send wirelessly that package over to the next car, but your your uh, digitally signed message and in, in encrypted message is inside there. Then it'll throw away the package, we don't need that external package anymore, grab another package and put that one and address it to the RSU and then it'll send that uh, message off to the RSU and this continues and so on all the way out to the LBS and of course the LBS sends it back the same way. So just keep in mind that, that, this, that these messages are payloads. Now part two. How can the parrots mimic the pirates if the parrots do not know the pirates, the pirates' private keys. Well, I'll say that ten times fast. How can parrots mimic pirates if parrots do not know the pirates' private keys? Well, here's the phases of crypto in the parrots model. First, we have a card that says he wants to be parroted. See, will you parrot me? 
Then we got a card that says, yeah, okay, fine, I'll parrot you. Now, it, this, is in, this is before the parroting begins. In the join phase, what happens is uh, the pirate, B, continues along, and the parrot will start parroting. This is actually after the join phase. It's the, the, the parroting phase will, will, will happen like this. But the join phase is, is the before picture there. So now, <coughs> join phase, will you parrot me, is going to be our query queue. The, the crypto notation for this is as you see here. Now, this uh, particular query will not be encrypted. So it will broadcast out to anyone around. If someone says yes, oh yeah, sure, I'll parrot you, then um, the it will reply s using the the VI's public key because it it got that from the certificate and it'll it'll encrypt that message there and it'll give its own certificate so that uh, now VI and VJ can have encrypted communication. So now we have a car that has asked to be parroted. We'll call that car the pirate, and we have a car that has agreed to do the parroting. We'll call that one the parrot. Let's see what happens next. What happens next is the storage phase, the message storage phase. We'll create a query that goes from VI to the LBS, and it might be, for example, where is a hotel near, you know, uh, whatever you want to say. This query will look something like this. Now, you'll notice that no position is specified and the particular message is not encrypted. This is the message to the LBS is not encrypted. We can't, be, we can't encrypt it because VJ is going to send it later on. So no position is specified. So now we have uh, the message that's going to go from VI to VJ is going to say, please relay this query, VI to LBS, to the LBS. And it's going to include the expiration or validity time of the VI's uh, pseudo ID. No point in sending anything once VI's pseudo ID has expired. So we want to let it know. That's no more than five minutes. We expect. Anyway, so now we have a message that will be the VI to the LBS. Um, with the, that particular message will be. Um, Actually, this would be from VJ to the LBS, so the message from VI. So it's going to be VJ will encrypt the message, which includes this expiration time. And um, shoot, you know what? I think I wrote this down wrong. Because the message should be from VI to VJ, and it has the VI to the LBS. That's the query. This query is correct. It's the qu it's the que the query to the LBS from VI, and inside it, this is going to be, um, oh yeah, okay, this is correct, yeah. This is the message that goes from VI to VJ actually, and it's, it, it uses VI's pr public key. So ignore that LBS. That should say VJ there. It goes from V it encrypts it with VJ's uh, pu public key, and th so that only VJ can read it, and then it has this message. Please relay this message, and then the message to relay. Bottom line, VJ stores um, this particular query. This is the query that VI makes to the LBS. Now we move into the parroting phase. The parroting phase, we use the position of vehicle VJ um, and the query of vehicle VI. And we encrypt it using the LBS's public key, and then that hops along through the infrastructure and comes back to to VJ. So the reply from LBS to VJ is here's the hotel near that position by B, by VJ. Um, notice that the 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 reply will be signed with VI's public key because that's the the key that's in the query. VJ cannot read the reply because it's encrypted with VI's public key, but it doesn't matter because VI is not really at position PJ, PVJ. So basically, our uh, VJ throws away the reply. He doesn't need it. He's just using it to help protect VI's privacy. 
Termination phase is completely simple. It just stops. The, the parrot stops parroting when uh, the validity time expires. The parrot will keep keep parroting even after the parrot changes pseudo ID if the validity time of the of the pirate has not expired. Uh, but there's no point in continuing to parrot after the pirate changes the pseudo ID. So that's why the expiration time is part of the protocol. So you've basically seen how uh, the PKI model works, the basic PKI model works, and you've seen how the parrot's model works. Um, so the only thing really left to do is to attack the idea and, and look at some of the problems. We can do this. I mean, here, I'll just do it real quick. The main problem that we're going to have is over parroting. What if a bunch of malicious vehicles overwhelm the LBS with requests? Well, one, the LBS could shut down VI's ID and set a threshold for the number of requests per minute. Um, second, up until that was VI's was shut down, it would have a great deal of privacy, the maximum allowable by the LBS. And of course, the shutdown period would only be for a few minutes because uh, the uh, the pseudo IDs change so frequently. Problem two, if they require, if the LBS requires a signed location, and you don't, you can't have the 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 um, vehicle sign the location. Or sorry, you can't have the a, a different vehicle append a location. Then the whole system fails. You can't. It doesn't work with that way. Parrots will not apply. Eventually, the market may decide whether or not drivers uh, or LBSs win the privacy battle here. But certainly, parrots is an option for LBSs to want to compete for drivers. They can offer more. You know. LBSs that offer parroting offer more privacy than ones that don't. Third, and this is maybe the weak, the toughest part, one of them all, parrots increases the complexity of conditional privacy. In order to find out where vehicle VI really was at a certain point of time, the LBS would have to keep records of the requests from VI, and the RSUs would have to keep records of the pseudo IDs uh, of the BSMs in range of the RSU. So. Well, that's a lot of data to keep track of, but you could still go back and, and maintain conditional privacy, um, assuming that there's no spoofing, of course, but uh, it should be, assuming that the certificate authority is not breached, that should be okay. And then finally, there's the issue of wireless congestion, the never-ending battle of wireless congestion. Um, all three, well, three out of four phases do increase congestion. However, compared to the basic safety message congestion, it's nothing. It's really an order of magnitude less than than the basic safety message congestion. So probably, if if the if the uh, basic safety message problem is solved, probably the parrot's problem will be solved too. So, you know, the model's not perfect by any stretch, but it's uh, you know it's an option. Hopefully, um, it's interesting for you, and hopefully, this conversation and discussion helped you to understand the parrot's model. Thanks.